I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome to the Gamekeeper Studio deep in the mole hole in the heart and soul of the mole hole building, the Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Building, as Dudley likes to inform everybody. And sitting to my left, which would be west of me, is Dudley Phelps. Over here, kind of northeast, is Lanny Wallace. Jason Hello. Cleveland is manning the, the board with the chewing gum and rubber bands, keeping it all together. And we've got a special guest in the studio today. Mr. In Bill studio Gibson. guest, yeah. Yeah, the our very master. own, the <laughs> okay. director of Gun Dog Operations at yes. Mossy Oak. So later in the show, we'll we'll ask him questions. He'll tell us what's going on at the kennels, and I'm going to ask him the all important question: Who let the dogs out? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah! Wow! Yeah, that was that's I, a good work. That was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> some hard work with that oh, one, buddy. My good. Well, <laughs> Hmm. Okay. So did need, you notice that the the air conditioning is working at the yeah, mobile home now? Yeah, I did. Yeah, sure is. So. Yeah, it is. So, uh, what's going on locally right now, Lanny? What you got going on? I'm really wanting to go and check some duck ponds. Is what I'm. It's kind of on my mind right now. Ooh. You know, and we uh, started. You know, we got finished up planting food plots last week, which we were late. But we had to contend with elk season. You know, there's some things that get in the way. Boy, elk season has really gotten in your way this yeah, year. Yeah, it does. It does. So you're checking to see what Hurricane Delta did to your duck holes. Yeah. See mm-hmm. what kind of water you've got. Yeah, I'm duck pond. I've, I've been corrected. Ooh, yeah. duck pond. Yeah. Okay. And then they kind of bougie sound. Yeah. It is. I've been told I need to call them duck ponds instead of duck holes. Yeah. I think duck holes sounds a little offensive to people. Well, have you ever tried typing duck call into your phone to text somebody. Maybe that's where it's coming from. (laughs) (laughs) It It doesn't say duck call. It auto-corrects to something you don't want to meet me at the (laughs) duck hole. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's where it's coming from. So Yeah, impoundment. I don't like that either. Yeah. So Okay. Duck pond. Duck pond. Mm -hmm. Duck Mm -hmm. pond. My millet looks as good as it's ever looked at the little gravel pit this year. Mm. It's excited you get your pipe put in. Yeah. So as you can tell, my mind's on waterfowl. The gravel pit. Are you referring to Little Stuttgart? Meek, 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 meek. Affectionately meek. called Little Stuttgart. Yes, I am. So what's going on in your world, Dudley? Anything exciting? No. Uh, nothing <laughs> exciting. I just got in an argument with UPS over the, on the phone. You know. <laughs> oh me. I'm trying UPS. to get over that. UPS. So you're in a bad spot right now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to call out anybody? I don't think I need to call out anybody, but okay. yeah. We could uh we could call them out. We work really hard to, you know, have good fresh, you know, trees and products and it's just really disheartening when they don't get delivered on time sometimes. Right. They usually do. So all you listeners, it's not that big of a deal, but right. Yeah. yeah, nine times out of ten, the package arrives, no problem. It's that one time. It's that one and, time. And it has been worse lately due to the virus. Well, so much stuff shipping. Right. So. Yep. Yeah, and a lot of stuff is shipping. And they backed their truck into our building yesterday. Well. No. We've got Rob, the lawyer. That can help that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, the, the blood on the biologic. Have you seen some of the deer that some of the guys? Uh, I'm still hung on that 200 inch typical of Mr. Jury's. Yes. Well, my plan today, after we, I was going to mention that Ben Mackey and uh, Rusty and uh, Joe White, they all killed really nice bucks this past week. Oh, good, good. Yeah, really nice bucks. I was just going to go ahead and congratulate Mark because I'm sure he's killed something in between podcasts that we <laughs> need to congratulate him. Yeah. Yeah. But his 200-inch, 201-inch whitetail is... Typical whitetail. Is, I think that's the thing that sets it apart from, you know... I mean, just was, it a, was it a 10? Yeah, I, I, you know what? I didn't count the points. I did, it, it does look like a 10 because it's... Uh, it, the, the points are pretty far apart. Well, let's just look at it. It's a giant. It's a giant. Have As you seen you, it, Mr. Bill? No. no Mark Drury killed a 200 and one inch typical 
whitetail. I think that's what it nets. With 200 archery equipment. Yeah, I'm, I'm more into those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Let's well, see. this is as big a deer. It's, it's just incredible. This yeah, is no. a big deer. It's a 10. And <laughs> it, it is a, a 10. 10. Typical 10. Wow. <laughs> a 200-inch He'd have been a big one next year. Man, you know how big a thing would have been next <laughs> he'd, year? He'd have been a good one next year, for sure. Mm, mm, mm. All right, well, look. Well, today we've got a real interesting show. Uh, it's brought to you by Gunner Kennels, our friends up there. Our uh, buddies. Yeah, they make a great product. If you've got a dog, Mr. Bill, I know you're a big fan of the Gunner Kennels. and That's great. Their uh, slogan is, uh, what is their slogan? Man's, man's best, best kennel. Man's best friend deserves man's Man. best kennel. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, boy, check them out. They are really, really nice, especially the Gamekeeper Kennel, the Gamekeeper Edition one. It is great. That one's real nice. Yeah, it's got that bottom end <laughs> door. <laughs> it looks good. It's great. So, um, today's show, we've got Glenn Garner, who manages uh, Jeff Foxworthy's farm over in Georgia. And Glenn is one of, he's kind of, he's like a Mark Jury. Uh, he's a southern version. He kills some big deer. He grows some big deer. And he's uh, he's one of these guys that can just figure out how to do things, whether it's bow hunting, rifle hunting. Get uh, it done kind of guy. Yeah. Give whatever. him a challenge. Big he's, as, build his own planner. Uh, you, yeah. You know, he, he, he's, he's just an incredible guy. So we've got Glenn, and uh, we've you know hope to ask him some questions about how he does what he does, and hopefully our listeners and ourselves can we can glean some information that'll make us better gamekeepers. So we'll get uh, Glenn on the telephone. Hello, hello, Glenn Garner, Mister Bobby Cole. How you doing? We are doing okay. Well, good. Well, we are so pleased to have you. I've got Lanny Wallace hey, here. Hey, Glenn. And, uh, and Dudley Phelps. And then we've got a guest in the studio with us, Bill Gibson, who runs the Gamekeeper Kennels. So, but and we're, Cleveland. Don't forget about Jason. Well, yeah, Jason Cleveland. I'm sorry, Jason. Golly. I'm so excited to have Glenn on here. <laughs> well, yeah, I know Lanny and um, Dudley, of course. And had the pleasure of meeting the other folks, but... Hopefully one day soon. Well, if Mr. We, Bill trained. What's what's uh, Bogey? Bogey. Yeah, he trained he Larry trained, Larry I, Burns' dog, Bogey. Bogey. Yeah, we had Very Bogey in West Point with for a while. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you, fine looking dog. He is a beautiful dog. He sure is. I but, agree. Well, look, y'all been getting all this rain. But so, uh, how does your? I'm call, I'm curious. How does your biologic look? Outstanding. Yeah, this um, this rain we've been getting has really kicked it off. All the fields are um, completely green, and they're probably six, eight inches now. Clover's looking great. Uh, everything looks good right now. So, yeah, timely rain sure does help. It, well, this has been one year where we've had, seems like every seven or eight days, we're having a major rain event so, come through. At least a chance. Yeah, everybody's had a chance to get some seed in the ground before a rain front this this go round. Yeah, so let, let me, hey Glenn, before we get go too far down the road, and forgive me because I'm we're just kind of learning how to do all this, but we need to introduce you a little bit. You're you uh you you manage the Foxworthy Farms. It, it, tell me if it, if I get something wrong, let me know. But so. Uh, and that's a what a beautiful place that is, and what what you, you you've just done such a great job on the habitat and the uh, the crops that you plant for the for the deer and the turkeys. It's just a, a, a unbelievable place. But more than that, you're one of the top bow hunters in Georgia, and uh, as evidenced by the record books, I think you've got a bunch of white tails in the record book, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I know you don't want to brag on yourself and everything, but it is a bunch. And uh, so, is there? With that, Bobby with that. wants to know the secret sauce, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. That's what he's yeah. He wants to be in. He wants to be there with Glenn. That's kind of what we were thinking with this podcast. <laughs> We'd get to ask you some questions and kind of learn what that secret sauce is. <laughs> well, I don't know if I have the secret sauce, but uh, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate um, over the years and in, in harvesting some deer. I have um, actually, I quit recording. Um, a lot of them just for the fee anyway, but yeah, I've, I've been lucky. Uh, but you know, it, it, it comes with the, 
you know, where you're at and, and what you do and what you put in it. And, uh, we've been fortunate to, uh, secure a good piece of property. Um, and, you know, our goals every day we wake up, you know, we try to envision and try to come up with stuff to make this place better. Um, every day we want to, in the end, and I'm talking we, I'm, I've got, my boss sitting here with me, he just pulled in. Um, imagine that. He, he left Atlanta to come down here to uh, <laughs> sit in a tree with me this afternoon. I think with what's coming and what we had last night, we're probably going to look like two monkeys hanging on a grapevine this, this <laughs> evening. But, <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, that's our goal. We, we kind of set that, you know, um, we want to leave this place better than we found it. Um, and in the end, I uh, I hope that's what we accomplish. Well, I think you're well on the well on the way to doing that. You got we refer to Jeff as our favorite gamekeeper around mm-hmm. here. We we just love y'all's attitude about everything and your southern boys and that endears us a little bit more to you as well. But uh so it, it, is there it, are are there things that you do when you key in and identify that hey, this I've got a deer over here that's something special. Do you do you start leaving him that area alone or do you put more cameras in there and try to figure them out? Or is there something that, that how can you help us understand just what's in your mind when you identify, Hey, I got a big one over here. Well, to be honest with you, I'm really, really struggling with a deer this year. Some of them, you know, don't create uh, as big a challenge as, as a lot of them do. But you know, you, when you ultimately get a deer, to age four, five, and six, and he's a totally different creature. Each one of them has a mind of their own. They do different things. Um, and with, I mean, we've got some, we had, I think it was eight different bucks that we had in the, uh, our four year old category last year that we were really trying to get through. We got seven of them through. Um, so we, you know, our upper end deer this year looked really good. But when you get them there, that doesn't mean you're going to find them and you're going to see them and you're going to kill them. Uh, I mean, this place is, we're, we're fortunate in having some big landowners locked in around us. Um, and these deer travel and uh, it's obvious, you know, what we're going through this year. I mean, we've, we've taken a few bucks early. Um, and you know, that deer that we're, we were targeting. But that's not necessarily always the case. So uh, I'm I was going to say whatever. I want to hear your theory <laughs> on 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 locking this deer down because this one, this one, Bobby is giving him fit. <laughs> he get some some years he's got them pinned down and he knows where they're laying down and where they're going. This one. This one's keeping him awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that'll make it that much more special. Yeah, yeah it does make yeah. it better. Well, he is special. And uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, I'm pretty sure y'all familiar with the deer that um, Jeff killed a couple of years ago. Uh, what a giant. I mean, he grossed in the 180s. He netted over 170. Uh, he killed him with his bow. So he's a, Harris County's new number one uh, deer with a bow. And I think he's what is he third or three in the state? Number three in wow, the state. That's awesome. Wow! Wow! This deer that we've kind of that, that's been driving me crazy this year. We call him Son of Sam. He looks just like Jeff Deer. Um, he he does appear to be a little more symmetrical, um, but I don't know if he would gross as high as Jeff Deer. But he's close. He's, he's, he's a good looking deer. Yeah. But yeah, he. <laughs> He shows up about once every three weeks. Um, nothing you can't pin him down to anything. And when the acorns started falling, he just went dark on us. Yeah, mm-hmm. got to put a little more work. Wow. Well, let me ask Jeff a question. So, <laughs> with, with a big deer like that, we were talking about this last week. Mark Drury killed a giant whitetail, and we were talking about holding your composure. Jeff, are there things that you do? that you go through in your mind to help you stay calm when you've got a big deer out there and he's getting closer and closer and closer? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I was one of those guys. If, if I have any outdoor regret, Bobby, I wish I'd start bow hunting when I was 20. I probably didn't start bow hunting until, till I was in my forties. Um, but, but, and Glenn had been bow hunting since he was 10. So I just learned from him 
And Glenn, you know, I drive him crazy probably picking his brain. But I always think, especially for bow hunters, that, you know, when you when you hang a set, you, you, you've got it, you have it in your mind what you would like to happen. And I think it almost never happens that way. So the best <laughs> bow hunters are people that are just. You, you've, you've got to be able to go, oh, crap, I thought he was going to come from the left, and here he comes from the right. He's not in the shooting lane. I got to I got to kneel down on the stand and shoot under this limb or whatever. But Glenn told me an, an interesting thing. He said, whenever I see a big deer, I just kind of tell myself it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And he said, and I'll, and I'll go through all the steps of getting ready, but I'm telling myself it's not going to happen. And – and so I kind of do that. I'm, you know, how many things can go wrong bow hunting, but to not get worked up. Once I identify that that's the deer that I'm after, I never look at his horns again. It, it becomes all about his body. Once I know that's that deer, I don't look at his horns. And it becomes about the body. And, and I'm going through thinking, where is he? Where's he going to go? What's he going to do? But I kind of do that glam thing. And I go, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Just stay calm. Get your feet right, you know. Make sure when you when you draw, you don't hit anything, and and that really seems to work for me. Now I I will come apart like a paper mache bathtub when it's over. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've seen good that. Lord, I've, I've had more people talk to me about. My wife said when she saw the video after I shot Will Smith, she said. I've seen you perform for presidents, and you didn't get that nervous and excited. Oh, uh, wow. That's what it's all about. Yeah, it is. I, I'll say this, Bobby, that some of our fondest phone calls have been right after the shot. Yeah. There, there's something to reflect on, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. that's – yeah. That, you know, Glenn, that's probably a good time to ask for a raise right in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were my friend, Bobby. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Well, I, Jeff, we're so excited that you we weren't expecting you to jump in here on this call. That's just a pleasant surprise. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I was helping my wife at home, and then I thought, man, there's a after this big front mm-hmm. – uh, and I couldn't. And I finally looked at my wife this morning and said, I got, "I'm sorry. I love you. I got. I got to go farm. I got to go get in the tree. Got to go. Uh, and it's you know tomorrow's gonna be a good day. We got about a ten or twelve degree temperature drop tomorrow, and I just wasn't gonna miss it. So well, they're kind of yeah, getting I, ruddy so, over there, aren't they? In, in, yeah, get, get start to get a few noses up in the air, mm-hmm. and you know those big deer, they don't, they kind of don't waste their time. We've just been through. Uh, a couple of weeks where you, you weren't seeing, you know, bucks at all. I mean, they were just, but I think, I think they kind of charge up before it, before we hit this thing. So I think yeah. it's about to, about to get fun. Oh man. When does y'all's hunt week start? This year we're starting it on November 7th because of the moon. Um, but yeah, they're the big deer are just now starting to uh, show back up and get ready. I saw one with a doe yesterday. It was like 3.30 in the afternoon. And there was three other bucks standing around them. So, yeah, we're we're just now starting to get into the good stuff. Uh, see, see, what I do is, is I just watch Glenn, and when his neck starts to swell up, <laughs> that's, that's, time that's, to go. That's when I start, <laughs> yeah. when I start putting my moth joke on. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. My, that- my wife asked me last night what I was in such a good mood about. She, she knows. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. Glenn, did, did you say that the moon that, the, that you were – you were uh, determining the start date this year based on the moon. Yeah, we're we're looking at a full moon for the first week of November, so we pushed it back a few days. And usually, we do it the first week of November, but this year with the full moon, we pushed it back a few days. Um, it's a real struggle, you know. If we if we do have a full moon and um getting to see these deer but yeah so we pushed it to november starts on november 7th this year we were talking about that yesterday the moon's effect on deer movement so we've then got into the to the venison jerky i saw that i was going to ask about that and and glenn has we got us a a traeger 
And mm-hmm. he's about got this thing figured out. You put this stuff on top of your head, your tongue will beat your brains out trying to get to it. And that's I mean, what I'm talking about. Awesome. That's good to hear. Wow. That's really good to hear. So, look, Dudley, have you got a question for the guys? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, we're talking about how you guys have a seem to have a knack for not just growing the big deer, but but getting them in the back of the truck. And uh, being in the South, that's exponentially more difficult to mm-hmm. do. I'm I'm sorry, Midwesterners, but that's just a fact. Um, you know, we've got everywhere you look, there is good deer cover. It seems and. Uh, you know, in the Midwest, there's all kinds of little fingers and, you know, narrow woodlots and places. Uh, do y'all have any kind of strategies for making making the deer more patternable? Well, let me, let me start by jumping back in time a, a little bit. I had a, um, of course, y'all know Jay Gregory and Mark and Terry and, and all those guys who kill, constantly kill big deer um in the midwest well years ago when i was we were doing a a commercial operation before jeff um acquired the place i had jay gregory here who's who's very knowledgeable kills big deer year after year um he he actually came down for a a, it was a five-day hunt he was gonna you know film but um after a couple of days, he packed up and said, dude, I feel for y'all down here. Every set, you know, <laughs> he'd get a swirling wind, have the deer coming in, and uh, they would just bust him. And um, so after a couple of days, he packed up and, and went back out west. He said, and when he was driving off, he said, y'all in the south need to be spotted 30 inches of horn just to have to deal with this wind. And you're exactly right. It, it, I don't know that you know, there is a tougher place to kill, um, a big deer than the South, um, just with our winds, you know, it's so, it changes, you know, every day you can't, you can't really, you know, rely on a consistent wind until you get, you know, later on into the winter. Um, but yeah, so what some of the things that we've done is, uh, since Jeff, um, bought the place is to, we, consciously added a lot more cover um which helps us i mean we were years ago you know when the callaways had it they they were totally committed to quail hunting so it was really open um they had a lot of their plantations cut down for quail which were you know 20 30 ba um basal area Mm -hmm. um in their plantation pines and so we used those areas that was already opened up and uh, we purposely thickened them up to um, so we could hold these deer mm-hmm. that we have. Uh, but And that's helped tremendously because, you know, our numbers have gone up um, a, a great deal too. So, you know, it's, it, it's twofold. One, you know, it helps to, to be able to have a place to hold them, but also when you increase the numbers, you, you – you know, you have to put a, uh, you really had to concentrate on getting the numbers and keeping the numbers in check or it gets out of hand real quick. Well, and I think one thing Glenn's really good at, I mean, whether it's, you know, through use of, of cameras or whatever is it, because it is thick, it's trying to determine, hey, you know, to me, like a buck, you've got, he, he's got a core that during, pre-rut and rut, you can almost throw out the window. But within that core, he's got a smaller core that's like his favorite place to hang out So, in, in bed. And so if you can isolate that, it, it's like when we have those thick spots, and, and of course you do all the things like showering and, and work mm-hmm. on your scent, but it's like don't hunt a stand in the wrong wind. If if it's not the right wind, stay out of there. And, and so with those big deer we try to have options. I, you know, I know where he's hanging out. Uh, if he, if, if I've got a Northwest wind, I'm going to hunt this stand. If I've got a, 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 a South wind, I'm going to hunt this stand and don't hunt them. You know, you get excited, but it's like, if your wind ain't the right wind, stay out of there. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lanny, yeah. Lanny, I know you've got a question. 
Yeah, I mean, I know y'all just talking about cover and how important that is. I assume y'all are doing that through um, timber management. Um, but, you know, food, you know, t- they got to be there and they got to be big enough to, you know, to hunt and, and to make the hit list in the first place. So if there was one thing you could plant, what would you plant? I'd have to say, um, hands down, is those clover. Um, it, it'll actually, I mean, in my opinion, it stays with us. Um, we can get two and even three, four years out of it. Um, oh, wow. It's some of the best clover that, that we've ever worked with. Um, I love the, that, that clover plus mix mm-hmm. that um, I have is one of my favorite. And for our area, in my opinion, it's, it's what works for us. So, yeah, y'all's clover plus is top notch, no doubt. And I, and I asked that question because I was assuming – you know, clover was a huge part of y'all's management plan, you know, and I, I appreciate you using ours, but just wanted to you know, just know how important that was um, in y'all's program. It's interesting. They're pretty far south in Georgia, too, yeah. and, they, and they're, they're getting it to work, yeah. which is a testament. So, Glenn, on, on planting that clover, is it – do you plant in the fall and then, you know, it, and then was it, it sleeps, then it leaps? Is that how it works out for you? Yeah, we, we typically shoot for um, – Last week of August, first week of September, of getting seed in the ground. Um, sometimes, you know, it's hit or miss. Like this year, we we were getting timely rains all summer long. And then uh, uh, actually we, we had everything ready by the end of August and planted a little early, and then we hit a drought. But So the seed actually this year stayed out there a good – week and a half, two weeks, I said two weeks probably. before we had any type of rain at all on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, now you can come look at any field we got. It made it, and uh, it was – they look fantastic. So I'm tickled to death right now. So we're good, in good, good shape. Good, good, good. Yeah, that, that is good. Well, let me ask you, uh, uh, Jeff and Glenn, I'm gonna, this is a, a question for both of y'all. Y'all have been managing that place for a while, and I would expect – that each year y'all have a lot of does that y'all want to kill, probably more does than you want to think about. But have y'all figured out a way to, is it better to try to go ahead and harvest all those does early in the season, or do y'all prefer to wait till after the rut? Or what's y'all's strategy there? Early and often. <laughs> I, like I, like, I, like I like Jeff. Vote early and vote often. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean – we we really work to keep those numbers at one to one or as close to it as we can get and our buck to doe ratio and uh, it's because we only bow hunt it's it's just hard and yeah. so we start from day one with the first sit of the year and and I've kind of evolved into I shoot every every sit I shoot every doe I get a chance to shoot with with the idea that. You know, it'll happen that I'll that I'll kill the buck that I'm after. But you know, we're we're very blessed in that we have a couple of programs. So every deer we we take gets eaten by somebody. Uh, but yeah, we have to take over a hundred does a year to keep our numbers. But and and we've seen what happens when you let those numbers get out of control. It's horrible for the for the health of the deer herd. But you also, your big bucks don't have to move to look for a doe to breed. You know, they finish with one and they walk 20 yards and there's another one. And mm-hmm. so that's a huge advantage of, of, of trying to keep that one-to-one ratio. Mm-hmm. Huh. That's good to know y'all yeah, are, mm-hmm. you know, you're buck hunting, but you're also shooting your does. A, a lot, I mean, you know, a lot of people shy away from that because they're... That's my favorite part. Well, they're scared they're going <laughs> to booger up their spot, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, you just yeah. kind of have to do it. How many bucks have you shot after you shot a doe? Tons. Yeah. Tons. Tons. Me too. Uh, with the, yeah, Luminox, you know, shining on the ground, bucks walk right through there. Uh, we've done that time and time again. But, you know, we're at a point now where we have to do that, just number's sake. And, and being because we do bow hunt, fortunately, my boss has got deep pockets and don't mind buying broadheads and arrows. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Office supplies. Well, we, we sure appreciate y'all. I, I, I think y'all are going hunting this afternoon, so we appreciate y'all taking a few yeah, minutes good luck. and talking to us. Shoot some does. <laughs> oh, yeah, you bet. 
<laughs> I always like talking to you. You need to come over here and hunt with us. Well, we we'd we'd l- still got more to We'd like to. We'd love to come film a GameKeeper episode and try to make a, a, a little television show about how y'all manage that place. Mm-hmm. I think that would be very interesting. That's what we'd like to do. Check those clover fields out. You, hey, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like Glenn said up front. It's I think why it works so well for us, we have a common goal, and that's when we die, this place is going to be better than, than when we got it. And, and yeah, I always think of it as kind of like the puzzle you never finish. You know, because, I mean, as soon as we'll finish one thing, either he'll say to me or I'll say to him, hey, I was thinking, what if, what if we did this? Whether it's opening up an area or cutting timber or planting trees or whatever. So it's, I always envision it kind of like a giant puzzle that you're always working on and you're going to die and that puzzle ain't going to be finished. That's a good way to look at it. That's the fun part about it. No doubt about it. Is Black Betty still around? <laughs> Black Betty is still around, yeah. Man, that's getting, the uh, that's the most that's the best piece of equipment I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting her a new muffler here in a few more days. Oh man, so she'll be right. ready to go when you get here. And Dudley, I need to get with you. Boss has got me on a tree project coming up, so I need to talk to you later on. Sounds fun, you know. I kind of like to talk about trees, so mm. yeah, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, thank y'all so much for being on, and uh, and and y'all, uh, we hope y'all have some some success this hunting season, especially and maybe even this afternoon will be good with this weather change for you. But uh, but thanks again, we appreciate all y'all do, and we really appreciate the way that uh, Jeff, uh, the way that you're an outspoken uh, hunter and gamekeeper, and and you don't mind telling folks about that. But we we sure appreciate that. Absolutely. No, I I, I certainly don't mind telling folks about it it's uh it's it's a wonderful way to live to be entrusted with something special and to take that trust seriously and and do the best you can with the good lord's creation Mm, mm, that's right well said yeah it is and look would you please tell your brother hello and tell uh larry we said hello and y'all y'all go have and bogey go have some fun this (laughs) afternoon (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, buddy. All right, buddy. Thanks, Take guys. Care. See y'all. Thank All right, you. See y'all. All right. I forgot to ask him about the the basal horn uh, oh, yeah. genetic defect in their deer herd. If that was still showing up, yeah. that was my second question. That would have been a good second question. Yeah. Well, now I guess we've got to get them back on. Yeah, maybe. Well, we are <clears> trying <throat> to do a show over there. And oh that, yeah, that could be because he's got. A Years lot of, of antlers, yeah, with the, that have that pedestal pedicle that's that's damaged. Yeah, that we can well, it starts them. growing inwards, and then gives them it goes into their brain and kills them. I think. Mm-hmm. Good careful, grief! Look watch out, out. Look out there, Lanny! Man. Watch out for that microphone yeah, in front of you. Just, hang <laughs> it! I <didn't> see that <laughs> thing. <laughs> Good lord! Well, that was fun. Well, why don't we take a little break and uh, pay a bill, and then uh, we'll uh, let's talk to Mr. Bill Gibson and. And uh, talk to him about dogs. All right. Sounds good. When I first bought this farm a short time ago, every single field was growing up with brush eight and 10 feet high. But it went from that to this. And even though I planted biologic with very little moisture in the ground, I was really amazed at the results. I just sat in this field with my wife as she shot her very first deer. We could not be happier. We made a memory that will last a lifetime all because of the effectiveness of the best food plot seed on the market. Biologic is better seed, pure and simple. Log on to plantbiologic.com to learn more. Oh, hey, everybody. Welcome back. Well, that was, i tell you what, uh, Jeff and Glenn, they are so much fun to be around. They and, are. And, you know, we've said it before, Jeff is the real deal. He gets out there and he's, on the farm, managing it, making decisions. Glenn executes the majority yeah. of it for sure, but Jeff is really hands-on and involved. Oh, he's a gamekeeper through and through. There's yeah, no doubt is. about it. Oh, they, it's it's definitely a group decision. You know, they, they and their group it. is fun. So, oh, they're yeah. so fun. <laughs> yes. I've been there. It's great. You know, and, and truthfully, uh, I wish Toxie was in here because he has the best perspective on this. He's hung around him a bunch, but Jay Foxworthy, mm-hmm. Larry Burns, Brent. Burns, Jay may be the funniest he one out of the hilarious. whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. 
Bunch yeah, of great so people. It, but they they really are. They're so much fun to be around. They are. Uh, the, the, what you see is what you get. So, well, did did y'all notice they mentioned the moon? I did notice I they did. mentioned the moon. I felt felt validated. You know, it's you know we've talked to two groups. Yes, you know, two of the best big buck killers in mm-hmm. the world in the last week. And both of them have mentioned that they they use moon phases, the, despite some of the recent studies supposedly proven that they don't really have an impact. I believe it does. What do you think, Mr. Bill? I know it does. Um, you don't get as much movement on a full moon. But even the human population, I'm an old-time law enforcement officer, 37 years. And when moon phases, when a full moon came about, we had more calls for service and more what I call abnormal behavior. <laughs> Shootings, cuttings, slashings, uh, robberies, everything went sky high on mm. moon phase. So it's got to, there's got to be some effect there somewhere. I, I still believe in it. I do too. You know, totally. One of my favorite times to hunt is, you know, right near the peak of the rut, mm-hmm. hunt all day on a full moon day. And mm-hmm. actually you can show up at your stand a little bit late. That's right. You know, Grab you a biscuit. Yeah, on the wait way. till the thermals start <laughs> rising and then go. Mm-hmm. And gosh, from ten to two, I'm I'm seeing a lot of deer. I'm telling you, this is getting me all fired up about deer hunting. I know I was talking about ducks <laughs> earlier, and I'm like, man, you're all over the. <laughs> I'm <place>. all over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there, there's got to be something to it. Yeah. I think there is. You know, it's like we always talk about it here. You know, you got science, and then you have applied science. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Yeah, I, I tend to put a little more faith in the things that I've seen. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not doubting science whatsoever. I mean, you know, those are just recording data that they're making observations off of. But you know, you know, you know, you know what you know. So maybe we need to get uh, Bronson over here to to discuss that with us sometime. I bet you he's got some kind of study. Oh, let me tell you, I got it. Or a science versus <laughs> applied science. He he may be able to you know describe it to us. Yeah, you know, in an easier way to understand. Yeah, yeah. I true. got an email from Bronson last night saying, if you want some uh, information on long tail cats, call him. I got it. Dial <laughs> him up <laughs> right <laughs> now. I, you know, we've gotten he, so he many. He can't talk about minerals <laughs> working in white tails, so we can talk about long tail <laughs> cats. You, you know, we've got so many comments on that show. Hey, uh, it's it's been really interesting, but I think two episodes on long tail cats may be enough. Well, we just, well, we, yeah, <laughs> and we've gotten a lot of comments on the poacher show too. Oh, and, good. And I'm so glad that our audience didn't think uh, or there was there wasn't any negative comments. I mean, we know that that show was a little out there on the edge, and we were we were kind of taking a chance that people might misinterpret what we were trying to do there. No, and no. I don't think we accomplished what we were trying to do there. But uh, anyway, a lot of good comments about that. So, mm-hmm. so Mr. Bill, let's let's get into Mr. Bill and the them dogs. Kennels. And what did you say, Bobby? Who let them dogs out? Who let the, I, I, <laughs> thought that, I thought that was good. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was so bad that it was good. I let them out every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bill is a very fascinating man. Uh, comes from a law enforcement background, and luckily he ended up in West Point uh, and uh, is, I would say, more, we call him the the dog whisperer, oh, you know, because yeah. he can communicate with these animals unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. I would agree. He speaks the language. No, so, no electricity used. Now, how would, right. how would it happen that Mr. Bill... Happens. Guess who Mr. Bill's neighbor is? Well, yeah, I know. I don't have to guess. Oh, oh you're right. <laughs> it's toxic. <laughs> so, anyways, we're real lucky to to that we're fortunate enough to get everything together with him a few years ago, uh, and combine our obsession with with British Labs uh, with him and launch you know Mossy Oak Kennels, Mossy Oak Gamekeeper Kennels. So. Okay. That's the the Mr. Bill Mossy Oak story, I guess. But now he's a director of gun dog operations there, and he oversees all of the kennel operations and training operations. Uh, and it's a wonderful part of our little old outdoor enterprise. It, it sure is. And, you know, it is amazing that his career path kind of took him all over mm-hmm. North America and should I also say South America at times mm-hmm. probably – but it ended up bringing him right back here to West Point, right next door to Toxie, and at a time in his life where this was just the perfect thing 
It, it, everything just worked. Everything out was in a line. Yeah. Alignment. Yeah, Great you, story. You can uh, blame our former mayor, Kenny Deal, for that. Huh. He's, right? he's the one that forced me to come down here. <laughs> there you go. And uh, take over his police department. And uh, that was after I retired as a federal special agent and uh, retired basically as assistant chief in Tupelo. And it just so happened that I moved next door to Toxie, and I was training my dogs, and Toxie came over and said, hey, how about training mine? I said, if I can use your lake, I'll, I'll take it on. He said, well, how much? And I said, nothing. I just want to use your lake for my water training. And I trained his dog, and I sold him a puppy later on, and things uh, got to rolling. And he said, hey, how about opening a kennel? And I told him, I said, look, I'm getting old. We might do this pretty quick or I'll be dead before we get it open. <laughs> <laughs> so about five years ago, we opened the kennel and we've been rolling ever since. It looks like you have so much fun. I do. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm going on 77 years old now. So if I didn't enjoy it, I'd be at the house. You don't look a day over 75. I know. <laughs> about, 80. <laughs> about 80. About <clears> 80. <throat> yeah. Well, I tell you what, it's amazing. Probably the best testament is the dogs that come back know him and love him. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious that they love him. Yeah, my my personal dog, who Mr. Bill trained, like when he shows up, he leaves me and goes to Bill. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, he doesn't see him, but maybe once a year. And he's got this patented <laughs> kind of growl. Yeah, that he, he does. He talks could, to him. Could you do that little growl for us one time? That's not really a growl. Just, yeah. yeah. Hey, look, <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it works like it a tip. It stops him. Yeah. You get it. We all, yeah, 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 our dogs. Yeah. So Mr. Bill has to train you after he gets through uh, training right, the dog. Right, right, right. And that's where the biggest disconnect is. The dog knows what to do, but the, the handler. The handler, a lot of times, uh, does Me. not get adequate training. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. We're going to start a school for that, too. Put you in there, Bobby. I need to be in there. Because yeah, Copper, Copper runs you. Yeah, he doesn't he, pay any. He's self employed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he sends Bobby out. He's in back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's nothing like him, though, I tell you what. Well, the good. dogs. Well, we'll get we'll get into depth uh, a little bit later on. So uh th thank you for being here. And you, what you do for the, the 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 brand is just incredible. There's so many people that I mean y'all see the post where people Talk about what these dogs mean to them. It's, oh, yeah. It, it's really off the chart. I mean, it, it really is, you know, a, a, your best friend for life. You know, it's the best way Toxie puts it, Mr. Bill puts it too. So that's right. Mm. They're special. I'm going to get one one of these days. Yeah, Dudley, you need to get, you get Dudley's got a three legged dog, if I remember right. Yeah, a three legged house dog. Yeah. I had one of those. Well, what's, the, what's the puppy crop looking like down there, Mr. Bill? Well, it's looking well. We have uh, one litter of nine and two litters of six. And Some, hopefully, the one litter of six will go home within the next week or two. And uh, That's sad. It, 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 it is. They're such great little pups to watch, <laughs> and then they're gone. But they make people they so They come happy. back, though. They do. Some oh, of them yeah. come back. About mm -hmm. six months later, they come back, and uh, they get a little training. Some yeah. of them come back. They have to be straightened out. Some of them come back, and they're really good already when they come in, so— and we've got two litters on the way. They should be here right after Christmas. Mm. It's always fun to go see them. Didn't you just get back from an elk hunt? I did. Quick, quick question. Did you kill a big bull? Yeah, sort of. Uh, he was 800 pounds plus. Sound like a six. big bull to me. Yeah. <laughs> How many shots did it take to kill that big bull? A lot less than somebody else I know <laughs> took two. I mean, there ain't no, there's no need in taking bullets out there unless you go and use them. <laughs> <laughs> two shots. Went down on the first, stood up, and was wobbling, so I hit him in the neck on the second shot, and he went down for good. That oh, sounds like what a real elk hunting pro would yeah. do. Yeah. That was That's my right. plan. <laughs> 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 Plans often go astray. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and you had to look one square in the eye. <laughs> you know, well, you should have paid attention when I was asking Jeff about how to stay calm, and you could apply that to your own hunting. <laughs> that's true. Because <laughs> yeah. no. that's probably what happened out there. Um, 
if you don't get excited, yeah. you're wasting your time going hunting. Well, Not you got to manage it. I, I made I, I I made the wrong decision. Is I mean, I'm just going to tell it like it is. You know, from my hunting experience, I've made that decision before and it worked out. You know, and this is one of the times it didn't. I'm talking about on the on the subsequent shot. So, the first shot at the bull was, you know, it was a long shot. I mean, but I should have made it. And I hit him. You know, not – I was a little high and right instead of where I like to be, uh, but went through the vitals. And the second shot is where I should have made a better decision because I was laid prone, uh, and there was – I saw his neck and a, a part of his front shoulder, and I was thinking I can cut – it was a V in the bushes. I was like, I can thread the needle right through there, and it was 300 – over 315, 20 yards – uh, with a muzzle udder, and I hit the bush, mm-hmm. and that's when all hell broke loose, mm. <laughs> and <laughs> four or five reloads. Mm. But anyway, we'll know. talk about more. We're gonna do. A, well, I think, Mister Bill, we, we were hoping to do an elk camp kind of uh, conversation, maybe uh, yeah, next we, week if you can. Yeah, you need to be in that. I was just trying to understand. Yeah, that that all elk don't take seven Mm-mm. shots to Mm-mm. kill. I just that's, that's right. my main question to you. And uh, the unit I was in was muzzle loader only. There's no rifle season. It's either bow or muzzle loader. And you yeah. uh, you muzzle loaded, obviously. Right. And uh, and tell them how you got out there. I mean, uh, the relationship with the ranch. Oh, uh, the guy, his wife owns the ranch. Came in and or called me and said he wanted to buy a dog. And so I said, well, that's funny, you know. I just had a my buddy from Ireland called and he's got a dog for sale named. Resilient Ruby. And he said, I'll take it. I said, I ain't even talked to you about the dog yet. He says, okay, I want Resilient Ruby. So, mm. And I said, well, I don't even know the price. He said, it doesn't make any difference. I want the dog. How about that? <laughs> and come to find out that his best friend had passed away from cancer and uh, had a dog named Ruby. How mm. about that? Yeah. Oh, that's special. He said, he said this is the that's one he's sort supposed of a to have. divine guidance type right. deal leading me to this dog. How about that? Isn't that yeah. awesome? Yeah, when I was elk hunting out there, old resilient Ruby slept with me every night. In the <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. yeah. That goes back so, to what we were talking about, his connection with them. Yeah, they crazy. Yeah. They do love oh, He loves them, too. Yeah. So you know, my, my dog, Copper, I can have my door shut in there, and I can hear Mr. Bill coming down the hall talking, yeah, yeah, and everybody, and Copper will stand up mm-hmm. and start, his tail will start wagging, and he'll stand at the door. And, and, and sometimes, grin. Sometimes Mr. Bill walks by because my door is shut. He knows I'm and uh, I'm busy, unlike yeah. some other folks around. Here. But he, uh, <laughs> but, but Copper, Copper, just when he walks by, then he just <sighs> and yeah. lays back down. He lives. And if I look in the door, he grins. He does. Yeah, he's a grinner, just like uh, Brazilian Ruby. We call her Kaja for call name. She grins. Lanny's dog Goose is yeah, the best. Yeah, grin. Ryan smiles we, all the yeah, time. Yeah. We need to get some quality footage of him smiling. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> I've never seen a dog smile like that. First thing in the morning, I mean, you know, and it's dark. Yeah, you, know, you don't see nothing but pearly whites. You look at it, you <laughs> And the funny thing is, and Mr. Bill, you can validate this. I don't know. They, they say dogs – sometimes sneeze to show submission is that right yeah well he he chron- he smiles and he'll smile so much then he'll sneeze and he <laughs> smiles and he sneezes so i don't know whether he's thinking you know I, I, they might think I'm showing aggression, so let me sneeze in between them but that's funny i didn't funny. know about the sneezing yeah a lot of people uh think that's aggression when they grin mhm but they're just glad to see you yeah and they remember you they never forget you yeah, but you can. I can keep dogs for six months down there, and then they take them home. They bring them back, and the first thing they do is run to me. Yeah. They never forget me. They love Mr. Bill. But, but one, <laughs> I think a major reason behind that is is that uh, our training methods are low pressure, and uh, the dogs like that more than they do a high pressure training. It looks like it's fun. I yeah. mean, the whole time it's fun. Well, they they want to please you. That's right. They want to make you happy. That's called bitability. Okay. In the, in the dog world, there's bitability and there's trainability. And bitability is that the dog is willing to accept training to please you. And trainability is is that they're very trainable. They can they learn quickly and they want to learn. Okay. So, two different things, very similar but still different. 
And those are the primary things you target when breeding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We look at biddability. We look at trainability. We look at overall performance of the dog, uh, driving style and things of that nature. And then we go back to all our health tests for elbows, hips, eyes, and a eight-panel DNA recessive gene test to make sure that the puppies are going to be healthy. Right. And you spare no expense to do That's that. Right. It's, it's, That's an, very, it's very important, though. Mm-hmm. It's a very important element. Who wants to sell a dog and – when he's eight years old or she's eight years old, they go blind because of PRA. So you you got to you got to know what the health issues involved are, and whether or not you can breed that dog and have a dog that lives to be thirteen years old in good health, with good good elbows, good hips, good okay. eyes. And on top of all that, it's it's interesting to me that you know how intensively uh, the breeding process is and and selecting the right dogs. But they all have a unique personality. Very true. Uh, that trait is unique to each individual dog. And that's that's one thing we like to get is we like to get feedback from people that buy our dogs to know how the dogs are coming along, what they think about their bit ability, what they think about their trainability. So we have that in our mindset when we go to decide whether or not we want to do that breeding again or not. Gotcha. We just don't ha- haphazard jump out there. And say, uh, well, we don't breed this dog and this dog. You know, we need puppies, but we're not a puppy mill. We don't have that many litters every year, and we're not going to. Uh, mm. About the most that I want is anywhere from uh, five to eight litters a year, and that's it. So you get in line, you get your pup. If you don't get in line, you don't get your pup. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, right now, we've we've sold some pups uh, very forward, like to 2021, 2022. Is there a color that's more popular than others right now? Fox red. Mm-hmm. And but it it sort of vacillates. It goes fox red, which is a, a yellow color phase, and black. That's the only two colors we have. And uh, right now, I'm getting more calls for blacks. But when they get to the yellow side, everybody wants a fox red. Mm-hmm. And all it is, that's the original color of the lab in the United Kingdom and in Ireland in the old days. Oh, is that right? The dark yellow, yeah. Like copper. Copper's a fox red. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Old, old Goose is purple. Kind of black. And he's so Goose black. A, he's a great dog. <laughs> Goose laid is so back. laid It's back. the most laid back dog I've ever met. <laughs> yep. But yeah. when it's time to hunt, He's, he's on. on. Yeah. yeah. He's on. That's what they call an on off switch. He walks slower than, yeah. than any dog, but you you he's, show him a dove or something and it it's So he turns it off in the house and he's laid back, he lays around, he's not running, jumping on everybody, chewing things, tearing things up. But when you take him to the duck blind to the dove field, mm-hmm. the switch turns the opposite way he's on. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny to me how attached he is. You talk about how slow he is and how he wants you know, y'all seen him come around the office, he wants everybody to love on him, talk to him. When that switch is flipped, he does not want to be touched. Like I want to touch him on the ear and he'll sh- He just like yeah. Timbo. Yeah. His brother. <laughs> yeah. Timbo in the duck blind, you reach up to pet him, he'll yep. throw your hand off. Yeah, he throws his beat. nose up in the air yeah. away from you. Where you know you see he's <laughs> ducking to you. But when you're in the ranger driving back to the house, nope. he'll he'll let you hold yeah. it mm-hmm. just the whole time. He's so, a great dog. So Mr. Bill, if uh if a guy's listening and he A might be interested in a puppy or B interested in you training a dog for him, how does he get in touch with you? Yeah, the best way is uh, two or three different ways. Email, and the email address is on the uh, website. Okay. MossyOfCows.com. Yeah. And then my telephone number, I can give you at 662-617-4769. I get calls from early in the morning to late at night. Okay. Man. And I don't really care, you know, if they call me at 9, 10 o'clock at night, they can wake me up. Mr. Bill's a brave man. He ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> yeah, y'all, y'all don't call him late at night. He goes to bed now. Yeah, I go. Asleep. I stay up late. You lay at thirty nine o'clock. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a been nothing but impressed, and uh, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. It it is so 
uh, refreshing to see those dogs, how they love you and how you enjoy and love on them. It's uh, it, it's there's just a mutual love fest going on when you're training a dog and they it's 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 a pleasure to watch. Yeah, to see him in action is an amazing thing. It really is. I just got some chill bumps when you mm. said that, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got a one of the biggest British labs I've ever seen. He weighs 78 pounds. Man. And, and he came in and that he immediately took to me. And he never leaves my side. If I'm, I'm at the desk and I let him out, he's sitting right there. But he's got to have my hand on his head. Mm. And when I'm outside training, he's right there, never leaves, never moves. What's his name? His name is Cole. Is, is that the – I was on a dove shoot. Oh, was, Cole. Were, yeah, I know a Cole. Were you on the dove? <laughs> yeah, so we were, were there. <laughs> we were shooting doves, and Mr. Bill was on the other side of the field – Oh, dog. that's and right. And I kept hearing somebody holler, Cole. And I would turn around and look for a dog. <laughs> yeah. And I was then, talking to my oh, dog. okay. <laughs> and then later learned he was hollered at his dog. Uh, but the that's whole confusing after, for the you. The whole afternoon, I was like, who in the world is <laughs> Hollering my name. There's not any birds flying over. <laughs> I might have to change his name. Yeah. Call him Bobby yeah. instead. You come up with some interesting names for your dogs. And uh, is there... Is and there, remembers every one of them. Yeah, but is there one dog through the years that kind of stands out in your mind? That, boy, that, this was the dog of all dogs. That was Loudbrook Fernay. Mm. And we called him Jet. He and I were best buddies for until he passed on about 13. And uh, we traveled to Ireland to run working tests over there in 2004. And we won the Irish International, and the Atlantic Cup. The Atlantic Cup was a, a contest between Northern Ireland and the USA, and the Irish International was a, a run between England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Republic of Ireland. And as a member of the U.S. gun dog team, we won both of those. Mr. And, Bill and Jet. Y'all yeah. are the only people from the United States that have ever won that. Is that right? Yeah. But they wouldn't let us bring the trophy back. It was a great big silver trophy, yay big around. They supposed they put our name on it. I never saw it, but they said they were going to. Mm. And, uh, they wouldn't let you bring it to the house, though, huh? No, I'm scared we wouldn't give it back. <laughs> 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 That's funny. Oh, man. Mr. Bill taught me that my name refers to a lame dog. Phelps? Dudley. Dudley. <laughs> you know what a Dudley, I told you what a Dudley was. That's a lab with the pink nose, pink lips. You can't teach him anything. <laughs> yeah. Unlike you. Dudley, our Dudley is pretty learned. Yeah, he's he's easy to teach. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> not, not going to go there with you. Bobby's, <laughs> Bobby's been working on getting him to get to the podcast on time. Of course, I was late today, so I can't say much. You have your hands full there, sir. <laughs> it's like herding cats, Mr. Bill. Yeah. Hard to do. Well, we appreciate you being in here. We've got a yeah. few more things to do. We'd love for you to stay around with us. And, okay. Uh, and at, for being a guest today, you're going to get a Levy Outdoors gun sling. Whoa, door prize. Oh, yeah, yeah. little door prize. I like door prize. Oh, Mr. Bill, I like it. All right. Well, Producer Cleveland, I think we've got at least uh, one segment with uh, that, some Ask Dudley. If, uh, Dudley, if you're ready, why don't we go ahead and get started I'm ready. On that? Once in a generation, a mind comes along, a mind that understands more than the average person and is more than willing to share his knowledge. From trees to food plots to fertilizer, Dudley Phelps knows so much that he has forgotten more than he remembers. And now he gives you the chance to ask the burning questions in your mind. It's time for Ask Dudley. Here's Dudley. Hey, Dudley. This is Tim Elmore. I live in uh, central Illinois. I have a question some guys and I were having a conversation, I'd say argument, about white and red oaks on which ones drop every year. My understanding is the red oaks drop every year and the white oaks may only drop every other year. So if you could uh, help me out with that, I would definitely appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, Tim Elmore. Uh, that's a great question. And uh, it's it's a little confusing because individual trees, you know, some of them seem to drop every year. Some seem to drop every three or four years. But uh, to answer your question, so you've got red oaks and white oaks. Reds are uh, there and they're in what's called a taxonomic section or group. So 
the section of red oaks, it takes two years for their acorns to develop and mature. Hmm. So all oaks will flower and try to make acorns every year. You know, they're not always successful. You know, there may be a frost or something like that. But so red oaks, they will flower. They'll have male and female flowers on the same branch. Um, and if it gets pollinated, uh, I think my friend Ryan Russell termed this, it, it becomes an acornet, hmm. just a tiny little acorn. And it, it doesn't get much bigger. And then the next year, it swells and becomes a mature acorn that falls from the tree. 24 so, months. So the process takes two years on a red oak, but every year it tries to make acorns. So you have acornets and acorns, or acorns, however you pronounce it, on the limb at the same time. Whereas white oaks, uh, they're in a section called leucobalanus. Reds are erythroballinus. Mm -hmm. The whites only take one year. So it, you know, and male, female flowers, it swells and becomes an acorn that drops that fall. Well, so, I have learned something new. Thank but you, that, Dudley. That doesn't mean that they're going to drop a good crop every year. So you've got things like drought, you know, flooding, uh, some kind of nutrient. You know, there's, there's a lot of factors that come into play. But it also boils down to each individual uh, some are better at producing than others, which is why at the nursery we try to collect from trees that more often than not drop every year. Thank you, Mr. Know-it-all. <laughs> that was sweet. <laughs> well, that, did you listen to what he said? I did. It was pretty I mean, I consider myself, you know, to know a little bit about trees in general. I don't know why I've completely missed the fact that it took, you know, red oaks two years for their acorns and that makes sense what you mm -hmm. what you see on the limb now acornet hmm. yeah i you, have been enlightened if you look closely you'll see yeah you'll see them bigger acorns further back yeah and the the acornets the small ones are going to be further down the branch because it's the newest growth thank you mr know-it-all <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Cleveland and his little sound bites. So thanks, Tim. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll send you a little care package in the mail. Be on the lookout for that. Thanks for that question. Yeah, great question. All right. Well, we're kind of winding down here. We've this has been going on for over an hour. Lanny, you got anything else you want to bring no, to the table? No, I don't guess so. We'll have keep on. You know, look forward to talking about more stuff later. I guess. It's about to be November, so it's about to get fun around here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fixing to be running uh, Wallace Guiding Service after this week, I'm sure. With Hayden? <laughs> yeah. Mm, that'll be fun. Yeah. Oh, Dudley, you got anything else to add? No, I just I may, I may go look at the nursery and check that check out the UPS truck damage. So they, hit, they, they ran into our nursery? Oh, man. What's Big Dave got to say about that? Oh, he's up in arms. Ooh, we should get we should call him, but no, that's not not <laughs> safe. Not safe. <laughs> well, right. we'll go. It's been a good one. I enjoyed this one. So, uh, Mr. Bill, we appreciate you being over here. Yep. And appreciate what you do every day. Yeah, we I do. appreciate the invite. And you're, you know what? Interesting about what Mr. You know, you just kind of say, well, we appreciate what you do, but it's seven days a week. Yeah, he didn't get any off time. It, they have to know, be fed and, and have to be taken care of every day. Yeah, he's an yeah, amazing they, man. They, they they send me a uh, email that says Friday is a holiday for all employees, but they forgot to send it to the dogs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> have to get them on that routing list. Same at the nursery. You know, yeah. somebody yeah. has to go water on every Christmas day. day. Yeah. You know, Easter. That's somebody's got to go water. It's a seven day a week job. It never yeah. ends. Well, there's two of the coolest parts of this whole place yeah, I would agree. we call home. So. Yeah, I would agree. All right. Well, uh, well, thank you all for listening. Why don't you tell them goodbye, Dud? Goodbye, Dud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.